All right. As far as the investment strategies for 2023 is concerned, the latest Outlook report from uh, Sankori Global Investment sounds like the 1958 Academy Award nominated film The Bold and the Brave. The investment strategy calls for uh, titled Taking the Bull by the Horns and points to opportunities dotted across the global economy amidst geopolitical tensions, elevated inflation and central bank tightening. Joining us to discuss the report is Efosa Alui, who is the head of investments at Sankori Global Investment. Efosa, good to have you physically in the studio. It's good to be here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yes, you're very welcome. Um, so, look, we, you've got um, a robust report here that really, really goes into a whole lot. I wanted to start with your um, global, your growth forecast for the U.S. and the EU. I think 1.5% for the U.S., 0.5% for the EU. Can you talk us through the, the triggers or what's informing your forecast there? So, essentially, um, you know, in, in response to, you know, decades high inflation that we saw, the better part of last year, really, we've seen, you know, very aggressive monetary policy response uh, to try and basically not inflation off of its perch and 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 that's the reason uh, we think that growth is going to slow this year that aggressive monetary policy actually continues into this year just last week um, the US Fed hiked by 25 basis points and essentially indicated that um, it will continue to hike until it basically tames um, you know inflation you know so on the back of that we we think that growth uh, will certainly slow and, and that's why we have that forecast um, for the US and the EU if, if you look at um, the sort of growth that we've seen in both regions actually over the last two years, really, we essentially saw a post-COVID bounce in growth, obviously, mm -hmm. but that growth is beginning to, you know, uh, come off, and we, we think that, you know, this aggressive monetary policy situation uh, would uh, continue to provide impetus for the growth to even continue to taper off, really, and that's why we have make, you know, the forecast that we have, um, you know, for the U.S. and the EU, and not just those economies, really. Yeah. On a global scale, we expect that growth will slow down. I mean, the jury's out as to whether we would have a recession. We don't think there's going to be a recession. Uh, you know, the jobs market in the U.S. remains really resilient. Um, the EU has proven a bit more resilient than we thought, particularly the pass-through of energy prices. Nevertheless, um, you know, the impact of inflation still remains very significant there. The U.S. has made uh, even more strides in trying to bring down inflation. Obviously, uh, the U.S. Fed got off the mark quicker than the ECB, and we're seeing the impact of that. But in, in, in all, we think that these factors will certainly, you know, slow growth down, um, you know, for 2023. And you've got uh, some uh, a portfolio strategy here. I want you to help us out. We, we return to long-term U.S. Uh, allocations, I think, for, for equities, um, reducing liquidity, and then you have overweight U.S. fixed income and equities. And then uh, help me with this, eliminating underweights, uh, eliminate underweights Bitcoin and global real estate. Are you saying that... So moving from an underweight position to a neutral or overweight for Bitcoin and... So essentially moving from an underweight to a neutral, right? Um, I mean, just to go through it again, we we think that, you know, uh, the, the sort of move that we saw last year, particularly U.S. equities, I mean, the S&P was off almost 20%. Uh, that's the first, uh, you know, bear market that we, we've seen in, in, in over 10 years, really. Mm. And on the back of that, really, we think that valuations have come to a sweet spot. Uh, we think that there's, there's really good value, uh, you know, in U.S. equities. However, like we highlight and capture in the theme of this report, it's going to be rocky there's still going to be you know, some volatility, certainly not on the scale or level that we saw last year. There is going to be some volatility, but we think that volatility is going to be a ride up, right? And, and we think that we're going to see a recovery in risk assets, particularly U.S. equities this year. And on the back of that, really, we've seen very strong positive correlation between U.S. equities and cryptocurrencies, right? Mm -hmm. And we think that you know, that's going to also have a thing to, to play uh, on cryptos this year. And that's the reason we've moved from an underweight to a neutral for, for cryptocurrencies. Now, for global real estate, um, you know, the real estate market really has been hot post-COVID. You know, however, we think that it's beginning to come off. If you look at the U.S., uh, the, 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 the rate on a 30-year fixed mortgage has uh, pretty much doubled, and, yeah. and that is impacting demand quite you know, significantly. So we expect to see house prices come off a little bit, not anything you know, dropping significantly, but we think that you know, opportunities to get into you know, that real estate asset uh, will certainly show up this year. Mm. And um, bonds, I want to talk bonds. Uh, you've got a, a chart where we're looking at bonds having a tough time um, in 2022 as a, as a result of central bank uh, tightening, you know, raising rates and so on. So, uh, yeah, so there's the chart right there. What What is your outlook for bonds, I guess, for 2020? Because the tightening still continued. The, the Fed uh, a couple of weeks, last week, the ECB, yeah, the Bank of England, and even in Nigeria, South Africa. So what, how do you see, but what's a, a bond outlook? Yeah, so the tightening continues, however, at a much slower clip, right? Um, last year, we saw uh, four consecutive 75 basis point hikes. You know, that was really aggressive. I mean, that's the most ag aggressive clip we've seen, you know, by the U.S. Fed in a generation, really, right? Now, we, however, see that that tightening clip is certainly going to slow down. 
this year already we've seen a 25 basis points hike. Uh, the market before the jobs report last week had uh, basically factored in the fact that we're going to have just one more hike and that'll be it. However, with that job number showing very resilient labor market in the US, uh, we're factoring in another 25 basis points hike. So the rate at which that hike happens is certainly slowing down and we think that we'll get to the peak of the cycle say sometime in Q3 of this year and, and that should see a situation where you know bond yields stay at that level and if you know we see you know things move in a way that the Fed needs to react we could see uh, you know rates come off towards the end of the year and, and that should you know bode well for uh, you know fixed income particularly if you are invested uh, at this point okay okay very insightful there very insightful what about the all-important commodities um, what's I guess in oil in particular and in the others how do you see commodities playing out for this year yeah I mean if you look at the entire commodities complex for last year it was essentially a year of two halves really right uh, you had the you know commodity price movement just before invasion and really post invasion you had a really strong bounce um, you know in commodity prices however you know after the you know Russia Ukraine situation uh, we saw you know commodity prices really start to come off you look at soft commodities um, you look at uh, gold and all that it really started to come off on the back of concerns that you know growth was going to slow down later in 2022 and into 2023 and you know we saw that really play out we saw crude oil top about 130 dollars a barrel right now it's just hovering around the 80 dollar mark you know so uh we we think that um that recovery or correction if you will that we saw uh in the later part of 22 uh would likely fizzle out just on the back of the fact that you're seeing China reopen abruptly, really. We didn't expect that China was going to reopen. In fact, you know, forecasts were that we'll probably see some kind of phase reopening uh, by the, the end of Q1 this year. However, because of the social situation that, you know, it erupted, uh, we saw an abrupt reopening late last year. And obviously, that's going to create some demand, you know, for, for commodities. We don't expect that demand to be strong because, again, if you look at what's been happening, China has been buying really cheap crude oil from Russia, and that is expected to continue. So we don't expect that to put any uh, strong upward rise in, in the price of commodities. However, it creates a really solid bottom for those prices, you know, so we think that, you know, commodities prices will, you know, get some support this year, but we don't see any strong upside, you know, this year. Well, what about, the, I mean, still on oil and still on commodities, would the, 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 continue, the war in Ukraine, is that still expected to, to support prices in some way as far as getting traders nervous or with, what, with, that, with the implications? I mean, we saw what it did to oil prices last mm -hmm. year, right, in February. So do you think that's that factored in somewhere? It kind of feels like the world has, you know, gotten used to that situation. I feel like we've essentially descended to a war of attrition, yeah. uh, except we see some sort of escalation, really, which, you know, uh, really is anybody's guess at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that that, you know, uh, geopolitical situation has the potential to uh, create, you know, um, any major shock, if you will, to commodity prices, at least in the near term. You yeah. know, we're just going to continue to see, you know, those skirmishes. It, it really is unclear what the plan is right now, you know, as far as the Kremlin is concerned with the whole Ukraine situation. We, however, continue to see the West continue to support support Ukraine, even with heavier artillery as things go on, you know, but th that war has essentially descended to a war of attrition as it is. And, and I don't think that in the near term, it has really strong potentials to upend the price of, uh, you know, commodities. Okay. Now, commodities are priced in dollars. Uh, I'd love, there's a chart I want to take a look at where, and I love the, like this chart very much. You've overlaid the, um, the uh, Fed funds rates with the movements in the dollar index, right? And as you can see here, the U.S. dollar index is up uh, about 8%. What, what What's, what's your outlook for the U.S. dollar uh, this, this year? Um, not as strong as last year, really. I mean, okay. you, 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 like, like I highlighted earlier, um, as the pace of uh, you know Fed hikes or the uh, the monetary policy aggressiveness, if you will, as that starts to come off or taper off, uh, the strength of the dollar would also be impacted. You know, recall that you know the the U.S. got off the ground quicker than anyone else in terms of tightening, and that was one of the reasons why we saw a really you know strong uh, move in the dollar last year. However, we also think that the U.S. is probably going to come off that path quicker than everybody else, and that. Should to spell some sort of softening, um, you know, in the dollar index this year, at least towards the end of the year. Do, do, a couple of minutes before we, we touch a break, do, what do you make of the argument that, or rather, the position of other countries uh, that are envious of the U.S. dollar being the reserve currency of the world? Do you see any threats? That, I mean, like we talked a couple of weeks ago with another guest about. Um, Brazil and Argentina wanting to have some kind of combined currency for trade. We know how China and Russia feel about the U.S. dollar wanting to. Is, is there any threat to that for the U.S. dollar being destabilized at any point in time as the reserve currency of the world? 
I mean, the truth of the matter is that the hegemony that the U.S. created post-World War II has been very much entrenched. It is really, really strong. Uh, a dismantling is going to take quite some time. But within the realm of possibility, that's not impossible. I mean, we're seeing China rise. We're seeing, you know, um, you know portions of the global economy actually trade in yuan. But the, the dollar remains king, really. And, and if, you, if you look out over the next maybe 15, 20 years, I, I think it is likely to remain that way. But uh, whether something gives or something changes at some point, you know, I mean, if you look through history, uh, it is replete with, with examples of that. Great stuff. All right, we'll take a quick break. Very, very, very uh, interesting conversation. And we'll have more on your global outlook. We're still speaking with uh, the head of global investments at Sankori. Uh, this is, of course, uh, Fosa Lui. We'll be right back after the break. Stay tuned. It is the Global Business Report here on Arise News. We're still talking with the head of investments at Sankori Global Investments, Efosa Iluye, talking about the global outlook. And we left off on the U.S. dollar. Efosa, thanks for sticking around with us. So before we went to break, we're talking about dollar strength and how you see the dollar uh, moving this year. I hope we still have that chart of uh, the Fed funds rates and the U.S. dollar index, where they're both almost moving in tandem. So if we, if we bring things home, Efosa, um, what does dollar strength mean for cost of living in Nigeria, imports, sending your children to school overseas, medical tourism, just everything? What, 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 does, that, what does it mean for us here? I don't think it's lost on anyone what that really means, yeah. right? Um, again, the FX situation locally has been the elephant in the room for quite a while now. It, it, something's got to give. Uh, it's got to be dealt with one way or another. Uh, if not, we would uh, just be continually subject to the vagaries of what goes on with the dollar internationally. And it will continue to stoke significant inflation locally where, you know, purchasing power gets uh, consistently eroded. I mean, if you look at the inflation situation that we've got, it, 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 a sizable chunk of that is down to the fact that, you know, that we have this inflation globally and we have the dollar strengthening globally. So it obviously has an impact on us locally. So a again, you know, from a policy standpoint this needs to be dealt with um, we have to you know take very bold decisions around what we need to do about FX and fix that else uh, the impact of uh, the debilitating impact of that situation becomes entrenched in the economy and, and that's really not good for anyone when we look at the NGX I want to get to, to stocks now uh, you've got uh, if you look at the performance from uh, 2022 so did 20% uh, NSC 38 percent. Oil and gas did very well. You've talked about oil, how it performed tail of two halves last year. Industrials, although we saw insurance and uh, consumer goods struggle. Can you take us through which sectors you like on the NGX for, for this year and how you think the NGX is going to perform? I think if you look at the performance of the NGX last year, it was a reflection of um, a couple of names that did really well, you know, it, it, you know, make no mistake, that was not a broad-based uh, upside in terms of, you know, the market really. So you basically dimension that performance and you see less than eight names that really produced that sort of return, you yeah. know, within the, the telecom sector, uh, you, know, um, you know, oil and gas especially was, you know, quite strong last year, you know, obviously on the back of the sort of movement that we saw, um, you know, in crude oil prices. Um, this year, I don't expect it to be significantly different. Again, you know, our market is really far removed from what goes on globally. And, and that's really down to the fact that um, you've got um, very, very little, you know, near no, uh, you know, foreign uh, participation in our markets today and and you know the the pool you know from the global economy is really very limited and pretty much muted really on our market you know so participants essentially will focus on um, you know companies with really good dividend yields uh, strong earnings and that has been the play for for quite some time and we're likely to even see that um, you know play out over the next couple of weeks as we start to see year-end earnings particularly for the banks start to roll out uh, for companies that have got really dis decent dividend yields north of 10 uh, we're certainly going to see some Money flow into that, you know, local money as well, and, and that will really remain the play. It's been a, it's been a market where corporate actions have really dictated a lot of things. So as we see those quarterly results, um, announcements, uh, share buybacks, and all of that, it will certainly, uh, you know, put some um, upward pressure on the prices of the entities that are concerned, uh, you know, with those, uh, you know, corporate actions. And, and I think that would be the play, uh, you know, for for the market this year, really. If, if, if we put up that that performance again, do you, so do you you think that um, so, some of these will be replicated? Like I know consumer goods, for instance, is impacted by inflation. Insurance, are just we just have a very low insurance uh, penetration uh, rates. Um, I, you know, there's also, of course, I guess the monetary policy uh, direction and how it impacts banks. So do, do, I guess you know, 
past past performance is not indicative of future you know yeah. outcomes of course but do you do you think we could this gets replicated in some way or there may be some difference this year I mean, gets replicated in some way. Again, like I pointed out, that performance was really down to a couple of names. And I think those names remain really strong, yeah. you know, and, and they will continue. So, I mean, MTN just put out, you know, full year results. You saw, it's you know, trillion, a, a blowout, yeah. really. You know? so, so, those kind of results will continue to endear investors and will continue to provide, um, you know, support and really upside for, for, for those names. So, uh, I can't put it past the exchange that we're going to see, you know, this kind of, uh, something close to this sort of performance. Again, all of this is just down to the fact that you really don't have any foreign money in this market right now. Thank you. And on that points is it because you you said earlier when you look at the ngx it's really a lot of corporate actions that dictates the movements on the exchange is that really does does the exchange um respond to real world dynamics so, because I, I was looking at um uh, ghana for instance in january where all this it was i think it's negative negative three or four percent Ghanaian the Ghanaian stock exchange because they are the debt, debt issues they are going to the IMF for money they got yeah. all this. we have debt issues here we have revenue issues here we have uh, naira scarcity fuel scarcity all these things but the market is up five percent so far so how do you how do you interpret that for the, for the NGX for me I think that's just down to the fact that um, again you, you you don't have as as much as uh, the kind of foreign monies that we had maybe a couple of years ago that has kind of dwindled quite significantly over the last couple of years mm. and that certainly has an impact on the sort of performance that we're seeing uh, it, it does respond to real world issues but again I think it's significantly more muted uh, in terms of how the NGX does react yeah. because uh, you essentially have a lot of local money managers and local institution, um, retail investors uh, that are basically running things in the market right now yeah. and, and, and they really don't look at those factors as, as much as foreign monies would and, and that's the reason we're seeing what's going on right now. Um, okay so now let's talk about the Nigerian economy and honestly we could have a full hour on just the economy alone I, I want to get into your um, your forecast for the economy I also want you to get your thoughts on the elections how whether you factor that in not asking you for any predictions then I'm gonna leave that out because that's not what you're here for but um, what, what do you see uh, you know in terms of the Nigerian economy 2023 growth projections and all everything else <laughs> that's affecting this giant. Yeah, I think 23 is the year where we really can't dodge reform anymore. Um, it has to happen. Something has to give. So for whoever it is that comes in, you know, uh, who wins, whoever wins the election, very tough decisions would need to be taken, you know, uh, with regards to you know policy, uh, particularly the fiscal path that we're on right now, uh, really isn't sustainable. We really can't continue on this fiscal fiscal path, and, I, and that's the reason we've gotten the downgrades that we've gotten, you know, lately. Just the fiscal path that we're on really isn't sustainable. So uh, decisions around subsidy need to, need to happen. Um, you know, decisions around the FX it needs to happen. It, it will be tough, but it needs to happen. I don't expect that these things will happen in one fell swoop. Uh, we could have a staggered or a phased approach, but it is very important that there are moves, you know, policy moves in that direction uh, to ensure that um, we kind of turn this ship around from a fiscal standpoint, uh, improve our revenues uh, and ensure that the outlook going into the rest of the year and, you know, further down, uh, you know, becomes positive from what we have right now. So it really is down to policy and really tough decisions. This is not the year where we can really kick the can further down the road. What do you say to someone who wants so what, what do you say to someone who says that if you and i know you said phased approach so i, I get you on that in terms of fuel subsidies right yeah. who says that if you if you take it out the impact would be fuel at 400 500 600 naira, and then the inflationary uh, impact or is it a case of where you've wasted so much time now that regardless of what the outcome is you just have to make that tough decision so you have to choose really so you keep you keep on with the subsidy and then Last year, we ran a deficit of $6 trillion. This year, we're on a deficit of $11 trillion. That's huge. So you keep on with that. We're probably going to run another what, $15 trillion next year. And then our total debt burden right now is about you know, $7, seven trillion. That's a lot of money. So something has to give. You know, we're like the guy that earns 1000 bucks and is using 900 bucks to settle the people that he's owing. Right. He has to earn more money yeah. to yeah. live sustainably. Yeah. That's what we need to do right now. Uh, on the debt side, I've posed this question to others. We see Ghana talking to the IMF, Tunisia, Kenya, I mean, a number of nations. Um, the answer I've been getting is no, but do you think at some point that Nigeria might be forced to join the queue with those other nations if with where debt is right now um, to, to get in line and ask the IMF for help? If we kick the can down the road on policy, if we refuse to do anything about subsidy and FX, uh, particularly this year, 
we might be first down that path. You do know, it. so it really is down to policy. How much patience from, as an analyst, uh, looking and head of an investment pool here, looking at the outcome for the other, how much patience should one have with what can realistically be done with whomever comes into office for these first four years? How, how much patience do you think is required for the new administration? I think, you know, like an African proverb says, the morning shows the day. I mean, whoever comes in, I, I would say that, okay, the new administration gets sworn in in May. Uh, between then and maybe August, we should get a really clear sense of what they're looking to do policy-wise, particularly for these ones that are urgent, that I described really as sort of low-hanging fruits. Unfortunately, the decision around stuff like subsidy is probably even more political than it is economic. Yeah. It, it will be a tough decision, but something has to happen on that front. Um, if we then carry on like business as usual, then that would not be a good path to be on. Okay, so I asked you for a prediction, but this is just your, your feelings for, for, for Nigeria. This is our final question because we're out of time. Um, um, uh, optimist, um, pessimistic, or cautious in the middle? How, how do you feel? As cautiously far as the, optimistic. That the right decisions will be made? Cautiously optimistic. Whoever comes in? Cautiously optimistic.